Okay. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, it was great to see everyone uh, attending this session, this meetup. Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, taking a sneak peek into the world of Liberty and Eclipse Open J9 JVM performance. Um, before we dive into the topic, uh, just a quick intro. Um, I'm Vijay Sundaresan. I work at the IBM Toronto lab. And uh, my role is that of a uh, performance architect for uh, these two products, Liberty and uh, uh, the OpenJ9 JVM. Uh, I started out my career at IBM over 20 years ago, working on JIT compilers. And I've done various roles within the JVM team and the Liberty team, uh, primarily focused around performance in some way uh, or form. Uh, Kevin, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and maybe Jared after that? Hey, my name is Kevin Grigorenko. I'm a software engineer on the IBM app platform SWAT team. Been at IBM for 15 years and mostly help on performance and memory analysis and production incidents. And my name is Jared Anderson. I'm the performance team lead, technical lead, but also the Jakarta EE, Java EE uh, development lead for uh, Liberty and traditional WebSphere. And I've been here for about 22 and a half years at IBM. And most of my time has been in the Webster organization. Great. Uh, thank you, Kevin and Jared. Um, so, uh, given our backgrounds that you just heard about, uh, I, I guess it's no surprise that we're here to talk about uh, something Java performance related. <laughs> and um, uh, the idea here is to just have a conversation about these topics. Uh, 30 minutes is. Uh, Pretty short time. I'm sure it'll fly by really quickly. I, I hope that what we can achieve in this uh, half hour, though, is to expose you to some interesting uh, different perspectives, how we look at uh, Java performance, uh, not so much from the top down from an application perspective, but from the bottom up, if you will, from the JVM perspective and uh, the framework that's running uh, at the next layer up, uh, namely Liberty in this case. Um, so, to give you a different perspective on how we look at um, Java performance, quote unquote, and also look at how uh, look at some ways in which we improve um, uh, performance at those layers. So we'll get into all that. Uh, please feel free to jump in uh, with questions or comments as you have as I go through. Um, encourage Kevin and Jared to do the same. Uh, actually, um, to keep it at a, a fairly informal level. Okay, uh, but before we dive in, <laughs> just a standard disclaimer about uh, whenever we talk about performance um, related topics, uh, your mileage may vary, uh, depends really on your system and the environment. So uh, just putting that out there. Okay, um, so let's start at a very general level. So when I say Java performance, uh, it actually means different things to different people. Um, in fact, there's no particular use case that uh, you can use to characterize Java performance, right? There's just a lot of variety out there, even if you restrict the scope to uh, application servers and web applications and those kinds of areas, there's still a lot of variety that can seriously impact uh, what Java performance means. Um, and I list in this slide, just those myriad factors. So there's first and foremost, there's the architecture itself of your application. So is it a monolithic application? Are you using microservices? Are you uh, doing serverless or reactive? All of these things shift the focus of uh, what, um, where the performance bottlenecks are really, or where the analysis needs to go. Um, if you have a microservices uh, architecture, uh, you're exchanging a lot of messages uh, uh, instead of making API calls in process. That can um, stress uh, uh, more of the networking uh, layers. It can stress the security layers if you're exchanging web tokens, uh, JWT tokens, and so on. So serverless, uh, again, pushes the envelope in a different direction. You need to really be able to uh, respond quickly to a 
uh, a function that was invoked or a lambda that was given to you. And so you need to be able to start up quickly and scale down quickly as well. So all of these choices really matter and uh, shift the balance quite significantly. Uh, of course, uh, we work on IBM's Java stack and uh, some of our customers um, are really huge enterprises. So they run thousands of server instances, um, really kind of uh, high volume uh, sort of deployments. And uh, there are also smaller customers who are running uh, only a handful of server instances. So again, these things matter, like how much, how many server instances have you put on to a physical machine? Uh, how much contention is there for resources and so on? Uh, of course, uh, deployments can be running either on premise or in the cloud. Um, and uh, the Java technology that you're leveraging can itself be one of several that are popular in the community. There's of course Java EE, there's MicroProfile, there's Spring Boot, Quarkus has uh, gained some popularity in recent uh, years. Uh, and finally, I'll end with the platforms themselves. They all have their distinct strengths. Um, x86 has been the workhorse for a long time. Uh, Power has its own niche areas that it operates in very well uh, that are increasingly very important in the industry like um, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, and those sorts of analytics uh, and those sorts of areas. Uh, System Z, of course, very secure, high volume, and ARM, which is famous for being low power consumption as well. So all of these areas are, um, I mean, there's a lot that um, <laughs> um, can make a particular um, deployment unique, uh, and it takes uh, a lot of effort to understand that environment, some of what Kevin uh, Kevin's expertise is in uh, really all of the performance engineers need to have that sort of skill set to go in and understand it, um, a deployment um, and really uh, uh, and, and, and sort of nail down the bottlenecks that are there. I'll pause there and see if there are any questions or Kevin or Jared want to jump in. <laughs> okay, if not, um, so. All those choices, obviously, there's a, a, a myriad sort of uh, set you can come up with through permutations and combinations of all those. But really, uh, in order to simplify things, um, we uh, map it down to uh, what we call performance metrics, certain key performance metrics that are what we track. So um, in particular, the metrics I've shown on the slide, startup time is the time that it takes for your uh, server to come up. Um, or uh, handle the first uh, request that it's given. Uh, ramp up time, which we distinguish from startup time and that it's the time that it takes you to reach peak throughput. Um, so as a, in Java, you have a JIT compiler. It's, it has to do a lot of work uh, as you're ramping up and workload increases to get up to peak throughput. Uh, memory footprint, which is the amount of physical memory that your application is consuming. This can also have knock-on effects on the density that you're able to achieve in a particular environment. Uh, response time, as the name suggests, is the time uh, taken for the server to respond to your request. Um, there are variations here. Um, there's uh, average response time. There's worst case response time. There's percentiles that people give, like the 99th percentile um, should be at least this much. Um, so. Uh, there's variations of this, but uh, easy to wrap one's head around the basic concept. And of course, there's throughput, which is actually the thing that most people think of when you say performance. It's basically what volume of requests is your server deployment able to handle? Um, so how many requests per second or uh, how many transactions per, uh, per hour? Things like that. And uh, invariably, uh, through all this, uh, you monitor your CPU utilization. Uh, and make sure that's under control as well. So based broadly speaking, those are the metrics that we care about in the world of Java performance. If you go and check uh, in the community, uh, uh, people talking about performance, it'll show a table, whether it's Spring or whether it's Liberty or whether it's Quarkus, and it'll list um, many of these metrics. 
Now, depending on where you are running and depending on which one of those uh, uh, deployment environments you're in, whether you're on-premise or in the cloud, uh, or any of these other variations, uh, the importance of different metrics changes as your deployment uh, model changes. So sometimes uh, startup time is more important if you're in serverless, for example, if you're starting up a server and running it for days or weeks at a time, that, that isn't quite so important, but uh, long-term throughput is important. So uh, there's a real tension uh, between these uh, metrics as well, which is what makes this whole area interesting. Um, it's not just that you know um, you can improve throughput uh, and uh, and independent of that improve startup time. Uh, oftentimes, if you have to make trade-offs, if you want to improve throughput, you may uh, penalize startup. If you want to improve footprint, that may lead to uh, greater CPU um, use. So uh, this is what makes this uh, a bit of a, a judgment call <laughs> that you have to make sensible trade-offs yourself, look at the environment, look at the deployment and, and act accordingly really uh, in that sense. So that's why you have tuning knobs, whether they're in, at the framework level or at the JVM level, but there's still um, uh, the notion of out of the box, right? Like when you pick up a new Liberty container or you pick up a new uh, open j9 uh, build uh, what you get out of the box is uh, those uh, projects or products trying to balance all of these metrics um, so what you get is kind of the, the silver medal of everything if you will uh, but there are ways in which you can tune and get the gold medal uh, if you really really care about startup time there are tuning knobs available for that if you really really care about footprint there are ways of reducing that but out of the box we try to make um, sensible trade-offs and keep everything sort of balanced. Uh, I'll pause there again in case there are comments, questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> keep going. Uh, maybe give Kevin a chance to talk as well in, in a bit. Um, so Java runtime for the purposes of this talk is, uh, as I said, the JVM, uh, which is uh, in the three of us on the call, we're most familiar with the Open J9 JVM and uh, the application server le level or the framework level, which is Open Liberty in our case. Now, I can go on and talk about these topics for an hour, um, like uh, I will at next week's um, um, uh, WebSphere user group session. Um, Kevin will be uh, conducting a workshop there for a couple of hours uh, talking about tuning and problem diagnosis and those kinds of areas. These are really topics that you can go on for hours or maybe even days. But uh, just to give you a quick um, sort of taste of what the, the kinds of things we'll be covering. Um, so uh, we'll be talking about the IBM Java stack primarily there. So this is enterprise, um, enterprise Java. So it actually uh, 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 overlaps or straddles many different projects. So there's the Open JDK project, of course, where um, Java is sourced from or the JDK is sourced from. Um, IBM has influence across all of these different projects and across all of these different layers, uh, showing our commitment really to our users around um, Java and Java performance and all, all of these uh, uh, areas that they're invested in as well. So. Uh, there's OpenJDK, there's a, a, a project called Adopt OpenJDK that's uh, recently been moved to a different location called Adoptium. Uh, there's, of course, Eclipse OpenJ9 itself, which is uh, where the JVM is developed, and Open Liberty, where the application server is developed. All of these communities are uh, there in the open. Uh, IBM has strong presence or leadership roles, actually, in most of those communities as well. Um, then there's the uh, systems level view. So uh, across IBM systems and Red Hat, some of the technology that we bring to bear uh, when, when you talk about the Java stack, uh, we're obviously talking about the framework, your application on top of that, the JVM below that, but it doesn't end there. Um, and uh, in the uh, WebSphere user group talks next week, um, uh, Kevin will cover some of the uh, uh, layers 
not just uh, uh, the JVM and the Liberty layers, but also the layers underneath it. Uh, and there's some real innovation possible at, at those layers. Uh, Red Hat plays a leadership role, of course, with the uh, Red Hat Linux and OpenShift container platform. Uh, and uh, IBM has two hardware platforms that run a lot of uh, really mission critical um, Java applications in the world as well. So what we'll be talking about next week is um, uh, the, not just innovations at these different layers, but also innovations that occur when you um, sort of straddle these layers. So you try to create a hardware uh, feature that would benefit Java, for example, or you do container optimization that benefits out of the box um, Liberty, um, how li out of the box Liberty containers perform. So those sorts of things are oftentimes the most uh, interesting and and uh, and innovative uh, when you cross over these uh, these boundaries and these layers and really try to unlock some potential that uh, wasn't even obvious to begin with. Um, so um, okay, let me let me pause there and see if there are any comments or questions again. Firstly, I can't see the chat. So if someone's commenting there, or there is some conversation going on. I, I don't see it. Um, no, questions <laughs> the, no questions at the moment. But no questions at the moment. Okay, uh, let me just uh, go through. So um, this sort of whole stack approach to Java performance um, really has paid off for IBM, I would say. Um, this is a taste of the kind of data that I would be showing next week, uh, but also the kind of data that tells you sort of why we are so invested in this uh, whole enterprise of Java, uh, full stack Java performance. So um, this is a slide that compares um, Open Liberty with uh, other popular frameworks out there, Tomcat, Wildfly, JBoss, and Payara. Um, the comparison is on an E7 application called Trade 7. Uh, and uh, as I introduce those metrics, uh, we're looking at startup time on the top graph, uh, where lower is better. If you have lesser startup time, um, that is better. If, again, the middle graph is memory footprint. Again, lower is better there. Uh, lesser memory footprint is good. And the bottom graph is throughput. Uh, where higher is better. So actually uh, more requests per second handled uh, is better. So you can see that um, uh, Open Liberty, this is last year's data. So just as a teaser for next week's uh, user group talk where we will present up to date versions of these uh, graphs. Uh, but you can uh, see the comparisons there. They kind of speak for themselves, uh, Liberty doing very well, 60% ahead on, uh, compared to the nearest competitor on startup time and memory footprint, and uh, almost 20, 15 to 20% ahead on throughput as well. Uh, and we try to be as, or in general, we try to be as fair as we can in these sorts of comparisons by just using every framework's uh, uh, container image that they put out there. So we're just picking them up and uh, testing them rather than configuring them ourselves and, uh, so that it's as fair as possible. So this is a taste of the kinds of things we look at and, uh, uh, and really the competitive picture, which is a very good one for that IBM Java stack that I talked about. Final slide before I uh, pass it over to Kevin here. Uh, is around Java performance in the cloud. So I talked a bit about uh, how we pick up container images and, and try them out. So out of the box performance in containers doesn't just happen on its own. Um, there has to be uh, work done specifically to make Java do well in the context of containers and uh, at, the, at the framework level as well. Uh, and the way we uh, look at that is that basically in the cloud you're, or in containers, you're paying for everything, the CPU, the memory use, uh, oftentimes running on a, on a public cloud which charges you, say, by gigabyte second. Um, so it, it's really, um, everything becomes important because you're um, paying uh, for all the costs. And like if you have on-premise hardware that you've just bought and can use it uh, in, in any way that you 
th that you choose to. Um, so there's uh, different uh, aspects of optimizing for the cloud containers, optimizing for containers, like keeping uh, uh, your deployment size small, the container image itself should be small, uh, recognizing the resource limits that are coming from the container, uh, judiciously using resources just because you have a gigabyte uh, doesn't mean you should go ahead and use it greedily. You may be running on shared public cloud where you have other um, uh, instances of servers running as well and you don't want to get in each other's way. Uh, and finally, um, fast startup time as well uh, becomes more important in the cloud. So I'll be talking about some of these topics in much greater depth next week um, and uh, also getting into some really uh, innovative things. We're doing a couple of innovations that are uh, pa quite path breaking in the area of container optimization uh, as well next week. So I'll pause there and see if there are comments or questions finally before turning it over to Kevin. Jared or Kevin, any uh, thoughts on the stuff? I'm good. I thought you covered it well. Okay, let's uh, over to you, Kevin. Thanks, VJ. So in, in the link Diane put in the chat there, feel free to register for the roadshow next week and I think also two weeks after that. So we'll be covering a Liberty Performance Tuning hands-on lab. This is a self-paced and free um, lab that you can actually get started on ahead of time if you want to come with questions or work on when you're there. And we'll cover things like how to run a performance test with Liberty and IBM Java and Apache JMeter, how to understand CPU and memory usage, how to use thread dumps, how to analyze garbage collection, uh, memory analysis, using a Java profiler, and uh, Liberty-specific features like request timing to find slow requests. So next slide, please. This is just a, a simple screenshot of you see you're going to have JMeter at the top, which is running the performance test. You've got access to a, a basic Linux system, so you can do you know, Linux administration there to check the CPU. And then we're running the DayTrader uh, benchmark application. So that's what you'll be running to then run the tools at it and simulate your application so that you understand how to analyze your application and its performance. Next slide, please. So it's just an architecture of how this lab works on your machine. So whether it's Windows, Mac, or Linux, you'll run something like Podman or Docker desktop. And then that will then run this lab, which will be downloaded from the internet from Quay.io. And that has JMeter, Liberty, it has a basic Derby database and LDAP for authentication. If you can't run the lab, whether because your you know, corporate machine is, is locked down or other issues, I will actually be running the lab myself during it. So, um, and of course we'll have check-ins. If you're running the lab, you can just come back at a certain time and we'll continue the next exercise. But if you just wanna watch, see the thought process, ask questions in real time and see what um, the activities are in the lab if you wanna do it in the future. So I'll be running the lab during that time as well. Next slide, please. So just as a, if you wanna get this started ahead of time, here's a link to the lab and you can come with questions. And it's very simple. You basically install Podman or Docker desktop. Then you, you pull the image, it's pretty large. So ideally you'd wanna get this before you come to the lab or if you wanna do it ahead of time. And then finally you run the lab with instructions in that last link. And then you just use a VNC remote desktop to get into the lab. Next slide. And these are the times and days of the Roadshow, so we hope to see you there. Yep. Cool. What's the, I have a question actually. What's the time commitment for uh, completing one of these labs? The lab is scheduled for two and a half hours. Okay. If you want to run the whole, so we'll, we'll be doing a sample of the lab for kind of the most important pieces of what you need to make performance faster in, in your environment. The whole lab itself it can actually go way beyond that. and. What's great about the lab is you can do it a la carte, so whatever you're interested in. Okay, nice. Thank you.
Yeah, I'll just make one more comment here on the web road show. So you'll see the dates and times here as, as Kevin was just mentioning, and you'll see it's like three and a half hours. And that's because we have the one hour presentation that uh, VJ will be going into more depth than what he was able to do quickly here. And then, as Kevin said, the two and a half hour lab, and you can really mix and match that to, to fit your schedule. So if you can't commit to that whole three and a half hours, you can kind of pick, okay, I want to do the presentation here and the lab here and and really uh, make it fit into your schedule as best as possible. So um, check out the link that I posted in the chat and I hope you'll join us. Cool, thank you. Uh, and, and then, then did this. you also want to talk, cover this slide? Yeah, we have a survey going on and you have a chance to win $100. Um, so we hope that you'll participate. We're really looking for some feedback on, you know, WebSphere and Liberty and Java. We have, actually have quite a few different questions in there, um, but two lucky participants will win a $100 gift card. So I'll paste that link here in the chat as well for you. And then of course the link is in the, the presentation slides, but I just wanna make that available. But yeah, take a few moments. Um, it, it is a little bit lengthy, but that's part of why we're um, offering that incentive that you have a chance to win $100. But we look forward to hearing from you. It really does impact the future direction of our offerings. Um, so, um, you know, help us make a difference in, in changing it for you. And how long is the uh, survey going to be live? Um, so we're planning to just run it through the end of this month. So you have just a couple more weeks left. Got it. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, yeah, if there are any questions or comments uh, from others, uh, uh, other folks who join, please go ahead. Um, I did see in the limited amount that I was able to see that there were some folks joining from other user groups and um, uh, other sort of uh, groups around the world. So if you're um, if you're interested in these kinds of topics, uh, we'd love to. Um, present at one of your user groups as well, or meetups that you have locally. I just, uh, I mean, probably have to be virtual still for uh, at least a few, few more months, but uh, mm -hmm. we're more than happy to do that and spread the word a little bit. Great, thank you. And Diane, uh, yeah, we're gonna make the recording available, right? On the community? Uh, the, this recording from today's meetup is that what you mean, Tim? Yeah, or Divi or, or Diane, I, I guess. Yeah, right? we should, right? I, okay. Happy to. Yeah, I think we can add it to the library. Perfect. Okay. Any um, other comments or questions from people? I'll probably stop sharing uh, and see if there are any final comments. It looks like that was it. Um, if anyone has any questions later that they can't think of right now, just uh, feel free to uh, reach out. If you signed up via Meetup, we're going to share a link to the uh, to any kind of follow up resources or or blog post um, uh, in a little bit, um, probably tomorrow by tomorrow. And uh, yeah, feel free to chime in then. If there's anything you can think of today. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, VJ, and thank Diane you guys, and everyone. Thank Have you. Hope to see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.